It is an execution week at Huntsville Prison, but the daily routine is unchanged. We come to Huntsville's death row to meet two young black men. There are more executions here than anywhere in America. 19 last year alone. The execution chamber is being prepared for one of the men we're here to see. His name is Kenneth Harris. In 1988, he was convicted of the rape and murder of a young white woman. He says he'll speak to us the day before he's killed. The other man is Glenn McGuinness. He was convicted in 1992 for the shooting death of a white woman in a robbery. McGuinness is waiting for a death date while his lawyers file appeals. Recently, everybody coming through is just really black. I mean, and then it's not so much as being black, but it's the age group that we coming up in here. I mean, we looking at folks, I mean, look at me. We live with the majority of our lives locked up or what have you before they take us down there to do what they want to do. These eight cells are, the, are what remains of the original death row. It's now used as a holding area for inmates who are scheduled for execution. They have a bed, uh, a toilet, and a sink. So this is now the death house? This is the Texas death house, yes. We presently have eight cells here, uh, but we, we only utilize one at a time. That's the way we operate. We have had a, multiple executions in the past, but we never have more than one uh, individual here at, at, at a time. This is the execution chamber itself, which houses the gurney. At the appointed hour, the, the inmate is uh, removed from his cell and uh, by a team of officers and led in here and asked to get on the gurney. They strap you on the table. Before they strap you to the they, they strap you to the table, a microphone is supposed to come down. Uh, once you're laying down like this here, what have you, then they get you and they ask you, do you have anything else? And, they, they tie a bag up into um, the rectum area, what have you, to keep you from uh, ugh, keep you from running on yourself or what have you, right? He is uh, strapped down, uh, first at the ankles. he also be strapped at the legs, at the waist, and across his chest. Lastly, he's, uh, his wrists are inserted through these straps. At that time, uh, the execution team will, will enter the room and insert needles into each arm. You know you're going down there and you get, you're going to get strapped to the tape and they're going to stick a needle in your arm, but you don't know what the actuality of it going to be like, and I really don't want to know. And at that point, I think it is um, the witnesses are able to come into these rooms here. Correct. Once a saline solution is flowing. And what happens then? Once the witnesses are in place, the inmate is asked by the warden who is standing at his head uh, if he has any last statement to make. We've had on one occasion an inmate actually confess his crime on the gurney. That's happened once out of 106 executions. We're told that they had a victim's his family over here in this booth right here. I've never been there, so I really can tell you in great detail how things are set up. We have medical technicians who perform the execution. There are three drugs involved. The, the way they make it seem as if you're going to hotel heaven, right? One being a, uh, a sodium thiopental, which is similar to what you might get at a dentist's office. Uh, to put you under. I've not been through the process. Now, I, I don't know nobody that came back and told me how it was. The second is a uh, muscle relaxant that opens the diaphragm for the potassium chloride, which uh, stops the heart. They say it's like eight, eight minutes before the actuality of the death takes place. The reaction generally is a heaving of the chest um, and a gasping sound as their air, as, as the air leaves the lungs. When you were arrested, how old were you? 17. And I had been incarcerated 
practically five years prior to that, in some shape, form, or fashion, in and out, in and out. 2 a.m. in one of Houston's black wards. Adam 83B checking on Houston Avenue. Well, I'm okay. We're here at, um, These are the streets on which both Glenn McGuinness and Kenneth Harris grew up. Crack houses are scattered through the neighborhood. Hey, who's in here? Oh, well, damn, they've all scattered. This is a regular haunt of crack smokers. They buy from the boys in the street and come here. Come here! Turn, whose car is this? Turn it off, turn it off. Whose car is this? My Come on out here. You got your driver's license and stuff on you? What? The officer knows yeah, this young woman up. well. He's arrested her before for possession of crack cocaine. Come to get Leo. Come to get Leo. Put your hand on the truck. The drug also wove its way through the lives of both Harris and McGuinness. As a young boy, Glenn McGuinness watched his mother, Sadie, become addicted and destroy her life. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it tears you up, in, it, it tears you up inside. It, uh, it make you not want, it make you lazy. It make you not want to eat nothing no more because once that stuff get off in your soup, you be walking around, you, if I can just give her a hamburger, maybe she'll get, gain some weight. It, it takes you from being this big and just, it draws you up and then you stop wanting to take care of your hair and you stop caring about your little face and you, it seems like you don't care no more. He would know that his mother was off into drugs and he would beg her not to use the drugs because he hated drugs. As a matter of fact, he didn't even smoke. She would always say, I'm going to beat this thing, Mac, and then me and you are going to be a family again. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, I wanted to show you the clock that Glenn made while he was on the work program. As his mother's life fell apart, the only member of his family Glenn McGuinness could rely on was his paternal grandmother, Early May Brown. Down here you can put your rings and you can put some little baby. Early keeps the only photos taken of him as a child. This is Glenn. This is a picture of him when he was a baby. He's like about a year old here. Fat little guy, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is him when he was... Uh, like the second grade, he's like seven years old on this one. And this is one that I had made. Uh, someone took our picture in the house. I didn't even know Glenn was behind me. I had this one taken from him from prisoner. See, he started getting into trouble when he was like about 11 or 12 years old. Start taking things from people. Because just again, I'll say he did this because he was lonesome. He wanted attention. Glenn Sr., you know, I don't know, it's kind of like abandoned him. You know, he wasn't around when Glenn Jr. needed him. I tried to get him to stay with me after I got married. Yeah, his, but his mother, she thought that uh, if he stayed with me, that was going to mess up her welfare check. So she said she started against it. It was at this time when Glenn was about nine years old that he was sexually abused by his mother's boyfriend. I called the police because I, they were do, doing drugs in the house. So in a lot of sense, I pretty much brought a lot of things on myself. What did he do to you, though? Oh, he had raped me. Just sexually raped me. And I couldn't stop myself from bleeding in the back and everything, right? So I put toilet paper and everything down there. It would stop. My mom had some tampons, and I put them all off in my underwear, tied to, tied to not, not around my underwear like this here and put on my favorite Lee jeans and went to school. It's drugs, drugs. Drugs is terrible here. Yeah. 
five year old and say you some crap. Which they have done this year. Because they're not gonna arrest a small child no more. <laughs> Dolores Hazen is the mother of Kenneth Harris. She says crack has destroyed a whole generation of poor blacks, her son's generation. We lost a whole generation of children behind drugs. Everything that's in prison, everything that's on death row, they are from the ages of 25 to 34 years old. We lost them peoples. It's a national phenomenon that's crowded prisons with young black men. Though blacks are only 12% of the American population, almost half of all prisoners are black. 800,000 of them. That's reflected in death row statistics, where 41% of inmates are black and where blacks murdering whites are much more likely to be executed. The young Kenneth Harris was no stranger to the drug scene, nor to other temptations. His first child was born when he was 13. How many children does Kenneth have? Six children. Kenneth got four boys and two girls. That's a lot. Well, what can I say? <laughs> so how many mothers were there for those six children? Six. Doctors have estimated Harris's IQ as between 55 and 70 and testified that he's mentally retarded. But at the time of the murder, he was also addicted to crack. He wouldn't do harm to nobody, but drugs did a whole lot. Drugs would cause you to do a whole lot of things. I've seen this. And Dolores has seen it happen again. These are her grandchildren. Their mother, her daughter, was also a crack addict. What's that one sad She's in jail now because Dolores put her there, she says, to save her life. Now. She's straight now. I watched my daughter go from 230 pounds to 98 pounds. I watched her almost die behind drugs. Terry Item, age 17, murdered February 14, 1996. Texas Cord Mealy, murdered September 15, 1991. These people in particular have no sympathy for murderers on death row, no matter what life circumstances might have led them to violence. He comes eligible for parole in 2005. He said he did it, and he said he'd do it again. They are the families of murder victims. They argue powerfully against mercy for the killers. They have to be removed from society like a rabid dog so that they don't infect the rest of the population. When these men murder our children, they put us into their life. Mrs. Linda Kelly was the first family member of a victim to witness an execution in Texas. I recommend to people watching it. It's not, the lethal injection is not a morbid thing. There's nothing to it compared to what crime they commit. My 90-year-old mother-in-law was there and witnessed it, and she's a devout Catholic, and she was glad that she was there. And so I, it's, it's, I do recommend that if someone gets the opportunity that they, they take it, and, because that's the only way they're going to have closure and peace of mind as to what happened. Just 48 hours before her son was due to die, Dolores Hazen got the news that Kenneth Harris had been given a stay of execution. He just called me. But see, I told Kenneth when I left, I said, hey, keep faith, don't give up. The judge told Harris's jury to ignore his crack addiction at the time of the murder. Now the appeal court must decide if that was a mistake. But y'all gonna believe me. <laughs> okay, then. <yeah. laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> Just wonderful. I knew this was gonna happen because I believed in God. I never did give up faith. This is Lisa. She was 28 when she died. And um, she was a warm, wonderful, loving young lady. She graduated uh, from high school with honors. She was at the top of her field as a legal secretary. He was accused of murdering uh, this legal secretary. 
a Lisa Stonewell, a Walt, whatever. The Lord kept impressing on us to forgive him. And when I made the decision, it was just like the Lord taking a sheaf of wheat and burning it into my heart where I could never go back on it again. In America, it's all about money. Anytime it's a black on white thing in, if it's black men involved, he's gonna get the death penalty. The scriptures say if you, let me just quote it. If you take a life, you must lay your life down. And um, I believe that. There's a wide gap between black and white perceptions of justice. A division as distinct as that between the races in Conroe, Texas, the small town where the 17-year-old Glenn McGuinness was living, where he committed murder and where he was tried. They had an all-white juror, a Jim Crow town, white judge, white uh, prosecuting attorney, and a black and a white victim and a black defendant. So what kind of fair trial do you expect? See, see how he grabbed that thing in the middle and then kind of swapped it around to be able to swallow it head first. Bill Hall was Glenn McGuinness's court-appointed lawyer. You got four of them. They're all mores. They're different varieties. This one over here. He's a man with unusual hobbies. They always swallow the fish head first. And unconventional ideas for a town like Conroe, which was once famous for lynching black men in front of the courthouse. In Montgomery County, there is still some, in some areas, some deep lines of prejudice. In my mind, I'm convinced that if this had been a 17, 18-year-old white boy that had shot and killed a black uh, maid or a black domestic worker, they never would have sought the death penalty to begin with. Basically, he was just a bad guy, is what the bottom line was. There are some people who uh, are so bad and just generally pose such a threat to the community that they, they need to be removed. Knowing Glenn McGinnis, his background and all the circumstances, I don't think that this, in my opinion, I don't think it was a proper uh, application of the death penalty. He's not a violent person. He never has been a violent person. He's very humble, very likable person. At his trial, Glenn McGuinness never spoke in his own defense, never gave the white jurors a glimpse of a life far removed from their own, and so remained for many a mute symbol of what they most fear. When you get to know Glenn, I don't think that he is a, quote, killer at heart. Glenn McGinnis never uh, gave any statements to the police explaining his version of, of what happened, didn't testify in his own trial to explain his version of what happened. Glenn McGinnis might have decided to lock away his secrets in death row, perhaps take them with him to the execution chamber. His friend on the road, Kenneth Harris, once he got his stay of execution, decided it was too risky to talk to us after all. But McGuinness opened himself up completely. Um, sometimes I can think clear about the whole incident and I can think about the whole situation that led me up to being where I'm here. He was staying with his aunt in Conroe at the time of the killing. That morning, he says, he found letters to her from his mother, who was in jail. She was begging for money. She was putting these little money slips, telling them, will you please send me some money where I can live or what have you, where I can get this here, where I can get the pair of tennis shoes, where I can get me some food and everything. And I read a letter and I can still see the money slips off in all these letters and everything. He says it was those letters that drove him to do the robbery. That's when I started seeing everything over and over again. I seen the scene, I seen what I did, I can tell you how I did it, like I got to tell you step by step. You're scared already when you walk through the door unless you're somebody that, that does it for a living. You're a paid assassin. You work for the CIA. You do everything fast speed. The hollering and the panic and the freaking out and everything taking place all at one time. Circumstances take you so fast in here, right? You just 
thing, the answer just has pretty much happened. Uh, she went to the back room, she just started hollering. She just started hollering, so I just shot like that down. The gun that I had was like, I don't know how to describe it. It was a little old bitty, it was a little old bitty gun, it was a little old bitty gun, right? Uh, it's just a little old bitty gun, it's just a little old bitty gun. You know, uh, 20, 25 uh, caliber automatic gun, it's a little old bitty gun. What did you see when you looked at those photos? Me. It's in a sense me. Because in a sense I was I, I thought I was I thought I was pretty much dead in a lot of ways, right? I didn't see me laying down now, but I seen me taking her life like that. I can actually speak for myself when I say what is you get caught up off in traps of yourself and you don't know. Because hey, you don't know yourself. I can see so many people that have been here six and seven years and all of a sudden eight years, nine years come around and they get executed. And you think with the longer you live, the longer your chances are of getting off death row. The longer the time go by, you think, well, you might have a chance. They ain't killed me yet, they might not get me, right? I don't know if I'll ever make it out of death row. I really don't know.